On this special episode of our Elite Video Blog, we show off our latest custom-built system, this one being liquid-cooled, not only CPU, but GPU as well. Now, we typically advise against water cooling for a list of reasons, but in this case, it was specifically requested, so of course we said yes. The end result is a downright awesome gaming system that runs insanely fast and at very cool temperatures. In this episode, we show you what it took to assemble the system and get the water cooling to work properly. Aside from the Corsair graphite case, we will be reviewing the ASUS X99 Deluxe 2, which is loaded with features and all the bells and whistles. We're loading this monster with 64 gigabytes of DDR4 from Corsair's Dominator series using four 16 gigabyte sticks. This system would not be complete without a solid state, but the Samsung 960 Pro is utilizing the latest MSATA interface for even higher data rates. The heart of this beast is a Gen 7 i7-6850 CPU, clocking in at 3.6 GHz. That's up to 24 GHz of power with Turbo Boost enabled. And the NVIDIA Titan X, boasting 12 GB of memory and delivering 11 teraflops of 3D data crunching action. And to make things even cooler, we're water cooling this PC with the latest EKWB Extreme 360 kit. Not only the CPU, but the video card as well. This build is sufficiently powered with a Corsair HX1000 watt power supply. The result is a massive, yet sleek and powerful system that was fun to build and hard to let go. This ASUS series motherboard is a beast. It is worth every penny. Plentiful memory slots, DDR4, five PCI Express slots. We're talking USB 3.0 and 3.1. Onboard wireless AAC, surround sound. It has got it all. This board was put together very well. I must say the white on black color is very nice as well just for an overall very smooth looking board. Again, this is the ASUS X99 Deluxe 2 motherboard. Bias, very customizable. Just about every option you want for overclocking. Performed flawlessly during install and setup. Again, just a very awesome board by ASUS. Nine out of 10 stars for sure. As you can see, plenty of expansion. We have just multitudes of SATA 3.0. 8 memory slots, that's quad channel DDR4, it is slick. Moving on to the memory for this build, our client chose Corsair Dominator series DDR4. Now normally we do not sell Corsair memory, but in this case it was provided by the customer. We do prefer crucial memory. However, this memory is very high quality, very solid looking, and performing. Not much to say about this memory except for it is very fast and we do have a ton of it. The aluminum heat sinks are very nice on it, it feels like very sturdy RAM. The heat sinks are not flimsy as you would see in some cheaper knockoff memory brands. Very impressed with the memory, installed flawlessly, worked flawlessly. Here we have the Samsung 960 Pro solid state drive. It is the M SATA interface delivering very high speeds, very, very high capacities. Here we have the one terabyte unit, which as you can see is probably no bigger than half a deck of cards. And of course the heart of the beast, the i7 unlocked 6850K CPU. This is the Gen 7 i7. What a beast this processor is. You want to talk about processing power? This beast has it. Insane speeds. And with Turbo Boost, we are achieving very high clock speeds. What can you say? It's powerful. And here we have the NVIDIA Titan X. What a beast of a card. This thing weighs a lot. We didn't happen to weigh it, but it is a considerable beast. 
even the heat sink alone is quite sizable. As you can see, many, many options for display. We have three display ports, an HDMI, and a DVI-D connection. This card crushed all of our benchmarks. Even at the highest settings, ultra settings, it was still achieving very, very smooth frame rates. It is a very incredible card. NVIDIA has done it once again with another great generation of card. Even though these have been outperformed by the latest 1080 series graphics cards, these are a force to be reckoned with. This was seriously overkill. We have 1000 watts of available power using this Corsair HX1000i, delivering the power at great efficiencies. As you can see, it's a modular device, which means you only get to plug in what you need, leaving the case very clean from unwanted wires. Very smooth design, very intuitive. For a gamer, it's imperative that the inside of that computer looks as clean as possible. With the modular design, that's exactly what you get. This Corsair Graphite case. What a smooth, sleek looking case. Although this thing is considered to be huge, I'd say full tower ATX, no doubt. It looks slick and it is smooth. With the full plexiglass window on the side, you get to see all the goodies on the inside and it makes for a very sweet gaming setup. Of course your system has to look good if you're building a gaming system. Regular fans just wouldn't cut it. So here we have Corsair LED lit fans. They look very, very cool. They run very, very quiet, and they are awesome. Here we have the EKWB Extreme 360 kit. It has everything you need for a water setup, including the heat sink, radiator, reservoir, pump, and tubing. You buy this kit, and it essentially has everything you need, minus the water. The most tedious taxing part of this build was, without a doubt, disassembling the video card and attaching the water-cooled heatsink. Here we have the EKWB water cooling kit for the Titan X graphics card. As you can see, it's pretty much a plate of aluminum sandwiched over top a piece of acrylic that's been routed out to allow for flow throughout the card. Pretty simple yet effective design. As you can just about guess, this was the most difficult part, was applying this cooler to the video card. Now as you can see on this Titan X, there are dozens of tiny screws that need removed from multiple places in order to get the heatsink off there properly. It took a good amount of time to do this. Here with the primary aluminum heatsink off of there, we kind of get to see a little bit more of how the cooling system works. We have a rotary style fan here, and that blows air over the aluminum heatsink out the exhaust through the display ports. Here again you see that there are many screws that we had to remove to get that off of there. Looking further after taking off the rest of the heatsink material, we find the actual board itself and my, what a masterpiece this board is. Just look at it. A marvel of modern technology. After removing the heatsink and all the material surrounding it, you have to apply thermal padding to the card itself. This allows proper heat transfer from the chips to the aluminum heatsink. The most difficult problem being is that spacing was not proper between the card and the heatsink and we had to use some of the existing thermal material from the card in order to get the spacing correct. It is critical that the spacing is correct because if not there will not be proper heat transferred from the card to the aluminum heatsink. Here you can see that we have it inserted into the board just to get a feel for how it's going to look. Here we have the beautiful case from Corsair, shown with the new LED fans that we decided to put in the case. We also see that the modular power supply is installed and awaiting other components. At the top you'll see that we mounted the radiator for the water cooling with exhaust fans pointing up and out for adequate ventilation of the radiator. There's no doubt that there will be proper cooling in this machine even when it's all buttoned up. What was relatively new to me is the installation of the MSATA card on the motherboard. Unlike traditional ones that actually clip onto the board parallel with the motherboard itself, 
This one had a vertical mount that you had to actually insert onto the board and then clip the memory stick into vertically. As you can see, it pretty much applies the same way, only this plastic clip was a little bit of trouble to get it secured in there correctly. An interesting design, functional yes, not necessarily the best design when you're working with the board installed into the case. Here we have the motherboard installed with the memory and the SSD. We're going to be dropping this into the case here very gently and getting it worked into place so we can get the screws installed. Now that the board is in place, we can secure it with screws as a new normal board. The water cooling kit was actually designed for a few different CPU styles. In this instance, we have to replace this little metal film that's on the inside with a different one to allow for the maximum cooling as per the manual. As you can see, the metal piece is set into place on top of the copper heatsink there. Now we apply a little bit of thermal paste on the CPU, only using the correct amount. Not too much, not too little. A very thin layer spread across the entire CPU. Now we have the cooler onto the CPU, making sure that it is centered and that there is good connection. Next we have four springs, followed by nuts to keep the heat sink in place. One of the more troublesome parts on this was actually getting the tubes over top of the connectors on all the devices. For the water cooling kit, you actually have to manually apply the tubes to the nozzles on each end of the device. So each device has two different plugs that needs tubing. We found that tubing was best applied using a heat gun, warming the end of the plastic, making it malleable. Then you could force it over top of the nozzle in a much smoother fashion. Now with a water cooling system, you are to use only distilled water. But additionally, there's a coolant formula that you have to mix in with it. This prevents bacteria from growing and other things that you do not want happening in the water. It's a pretty simple process. You empty the bottle into the recommended amount of water, stir, and you're ready to go. Just be sure not to spill any on you or leave any out for someone or something to drink. They give you an entire kit for a water cooler. They don't bother to give you a funnel, which I think would be pretty crucial for, you know, getting the fluid in there. The instruction set shows a beaker. Like we have a lab beaker just hanging around here that you just pour it in there, and that still wouldn't even be good. So here we have our entire water cooling system set up. We have all of our tubes going uh, to the appropriate places. We have the radiator going to the pump, the pump to the reservoir, the reservoir to the video card, video card to the CPU to the radiator. In reality, flow is going from the radiator to the CPU to the video card into the reservoir, and the reservoir is being fed into the pump, and the pump is pumping the fluid through the radiator. So um, here we're going to try to uh, fill this up very carefully. I'm going to try just a little bit here to see how difficult it is by hand. Be okay. This is extremely fun and nerve-wracking at the same time. So uh, what we need to do here, we're going to turn it on for a moment, get some of the fluid going. And uh, we'll have to turn it off and the fluid gets low, fill it back up, 
repeat this until the fluid comes all the way back through the system. So uh, here we go. Here we go. So I'm going to attempt to raise this up higher to try to get more pressure in the system. There we go. I just don't think this pump is strong enough. Or there's, there's some type of flow issue. What I had discovered is that in order to get flow, I had to reverse siphon the water flow. This was accomplished by blowing air into the coolant reservoir, much like blowing up a balloon, causing pressure to push up through the pump, getting water circulation to happen. By applying pressure into the system, it forced enough water to get going through to eventually create a flow. This had to be done several times, but eventually, flow began to happen. Here as we zoom in, you can see the water flow beginning to happen in the tubes. Applying pressure, getting flow, applying more pressure, getting more flow. There's a lot of air to be worked out of the system because initially, the only thing in the tubes in the reservoir and the radiator is air. Now we have water flowing through the system. As you can see, there are still a lot of air bubbles, but that's to be expected. Those will work themselves out as the water hits the reserve. There's also a fair amount of bubbles in the heat sinks, but those will eventually work themselves out. Now with proper water flow, it's time to turn this puppy on to see if she lights up. As a reminder, we do not recommend water cooling for a number of obvious reasons. And another reminder, electronics do not like water. So to test this further, we had to leave it overnight for a 24 hour burn-in test. And by burn-in, I mean a watertight check. Here we have the next day, water flowing, no leaks. So we're good to go. It passed our overnight test, water still flowing, and not a drop is outside of the tubes or heat sinks. This means we're just about ready to power this girl on to see what it can do. As you can see here, there are still a considerable amount of bubbles in the video card heatsink. And these remained here for quite some time. Even until the customer came to pick up the card, there were still some air bubbles that needed worked out. To accomplish this, squeezing the tube going from the CPU to the video card helped to squeeze some of those bubbles out. Otherwise, it was like playing a game of Labyrinth, the game with the marble where you have to move around to get it to the other side. Basically a maze. Well, that's essentially what you had to do, is tilt and angle the computer in all types of different ways until the air bubbles eventually work themselves out. From here it gets pretty trivial. A lot of fidgeting with wires, moving stuff around, trying this, trying that. But eventually, you get all the components installed on the machine. The only downside I'll say about the case is that it came with a million cables on the front panel. They were all tangled up and they were just a jumbled mess, pretty much impossible to work with. You couldn't even straighten them out all the way because a lot of the cables were intertwined in a way to which they couldn't be straightened out because they were connected to things or devices. The front panel on the case also did not work when we tried to select fan speeds. None of the fans worked when you hooked them up, ultimately the fans worked when we hooked them up directly to the board. We just decided not to have the front panel control any of the fans and just let the motherboard do that through software. 
Here, if I had a dollar for every time that I had to turn this machine around to get cables just in the right place or certain something right where it should be, I could probably afford my own i7 gaming rig. Here we give it a couple final spins, verify that everything's in place, and we're good to go. Final inspections being made, we have to make sure that this thing is in perfect condition before we power it on. We don't want any foul ups when this thing goes live. Remember, we haven't powered on the board yet. All we've done is powered on the pump to the radiator. Of course, all of my monitors on the bench only have VGA, so I had to pull out a monitor with HDMI because the video card has no VGA connection. In addition, the DVI out is digital, so you can't use a DVI to VGA converter. Alright folks, here we are, the moment of truth. We have our water cooling system installed, we have all of our hardware wired up, ready to go. We are about to turn this puppy on to see what happens. So, without further ado, the water cooling beast. Immediately when turning on the power supply, we get this very cool oscillating uh, light that's coming off the motherboard. Very cool feature. We're gonna go ahead and power it up. Here we go. Also helps if you have the video plugged in. <laughs> hey, look at that. 64 gigs of DDR4, Core i7 6850, 3.6 gigahertz. Look at this bias. This bias has everything in a graphical user interface that you would ever want. All types of fan speeds, temperatures, voltages, you name it, it's in the bias. This board is an overclocker's dream. So due to the radiator being so large, we couldn't fit an actual regular size CD-ROM in it. So we opted just not to have a CD-ROM in it. Here you see one plugged up externally. We are loading up Windows 10. As you can see so far, this build has really come along. From nothing but a shell of a case and parts, this machine is now loaded and looking good. Just admire the beauty of this. The fans, the cooling, the heat sinks, the motherboard, the LEDs. It's just a masterpiece of hardware. As you can see, the liquidity on this game here is just sick. So smooth, such high frame rates, and CPU and GPU temperatures are still very nice. The GPU especially ran cool. We were really impressed with the temperatures of the GPU. Here we have the latest 3D Mark demo running and it is just crushing it. At times, like in this particular test, we had Prime 95 running in all but one core and 3D Mark running on top of that. GPU at 99%, CPU at 99%, and we're still getting well over 40 frames a second at ultra detail on this demo. You may not even be able to tell in this video, but the smoothness that this card generated, 40 frames a second felt more like 60. All things considered, this is a sweet build. So what did we learn from this build? It's fun to do them. What else did we learn? Water cooling is a pain in the butt. Done properly, it can make for a very awesome system that runs very, very cool. Unless you're overclocking, there's really no need for water cooling. However, just for the sheer looks alone, it does have its weight. Additionally, what we learned is that video card cooling is a can of worms that we had no idea. I'm sure other video cards may be easier, but the Titan X series had many, many screws to remove, many stipulations to it, and just didn't line up right with the water cooling system. Some modifications had to be made. 
all in all, the system is sick. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more great videos from Elite Networks. Until the next great build, this is Noah with Elite Networks. Have a good one.